Okay, so right now we have Supply Chain Security, the Office of National Cyber Director Perspective. And Andrew, is he doing it remote? Okay, so Andrew will presenting remotely, and we'll go ahead and pass it over to him. Thank you. All right. Um, hi, everyone. Um, first off, I just want to check that I do not have an option on here to share the slides. Would someone else be able to share the slides that I have? Hey, Andrew. Yeah, I'll, I'll share them in here. You'll just have to say All next right. slide a whole lot. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. I can live with that. So, um, yeah, as you can see, sorry for not, for not being there in person today. And for, for Jerry rigging a system here, um, if you hear wind, I apologize for that as well. Um, long story short is I really wanted to be there, uh, but it is school break where I am. And let's just say that if I had to worry about, I'd have to worry, a lot, worry about a lot more than supply chain risk if I, if I had changed my family's vacation plans. So this was the second best option. So this is what we have on hand. Um, to give you an idea, I'm going to try and talk for roughly 30 minutes or so, maybe a little more, maybe a little less, you know, open things up for a couple of questions and answers. And then ideally, depending on how that goes, let everyone have a little break before your uh, next speaker. So that being said, my name is Andrew Pasternak. I'm a senior policy advisor in the Office of the National Cyber Director. I focus on supply chain and technology security, which is as broad as you can imagine, covering a wide array of issues from those that we're going to talk about today, to interagency issues, um, to some of the policy issues that you see every day coming out of the White House. Uh, before I was here, I was at the cyber, I was at CISA, where I did uh, critical infrastructure risk analysis uh, related to cyber and physical risks and worked on the various supply chain EOs executive orders that you've seen come out over the last few years. So with that, we can go ahead and start diving in. Uh, next slide. Uh, as you see here, we'll talk about a few things. We'll start with a little bit of a intro to, to ONCD and supply chain. ONCD itself is still only a couple years old, so it's always good to start with that. Uh, talk about, about supply chain within the NCS, or what I'll call the NCS for short, the National Cybersecurity Strategy. And with that as well, the National Cybersecurity Strategy Implementation Plan. And then I'll talk about two of the ongoing efforts within my office. One is a report that was released in February called Back to the Building Block, which focuses on memory safety and software security measurability. And then I'll get a bit into some of the semiconductor security work that our office has been doing with um, the private sector and other agencies. And then end it in time for Q&A. So next slide. Yeah, so, so ONCD, and like any good, any good agency, we like to go back to our statutory authority, right? This is something that every agency will, will do at some point or another. So for us, we point back to the fact that ONCD was created in 2021 and is one of the newest components within the Executive Office of the President. And one of the jobs of NCD is to serve as the principal advisor to the President on cybersecurity policy and strategy relating to the coordination of Supply chain, or as you see here, security of ICTS and promote national supply chain risk and vendor security. Uh, and this, what this really means is that, you know, this is, this is an issue that's baked into the office. This is one of those things that we are, you know, that, that Congress was thinking of when they were thinking, what would NCD do? You see some of the other duties down there as well. You're talking about leading coordination of national cyber policy and implementation. You're talking about incident response. Um, and you're talking about, you know, the coordination and consultation with private sector leaders, you know, things like conferences like today or even just meetings, being able to make sure that everyone is working on the same page. And, we, we, you know, we would be remiss if we didn't talk about the primary goal of, of, or the primary document from ONCD, which is the National Cybersecurity Strategy, which was issued, as it says, on March 2nd here. And it's really critical to understanding the government's efforts across cyberspace, you know, detailing that comprehensive approach of the administration to secure cyberspace and ensure Americans are in the strongest possible position to realize all the benefits of that digital ecosystem. There's really two fundamental shifts that really are like the, are oversee everything else, all, all the other pillars and objectives that we'll mention 
you know, those are the balancing responsibility to defend cyberspace. You know, from, from the administration perspective, it should not be simply the end users who are primarily responsible. It really needs to be pushed up to those who have the capability to defend cyberspace. And realigning incentives to favor a long-term investment. You know, especially with things like security, some of the things we'll talk about today and others are a matter of years, if not decades. And because of that, we really need to be able to uh, incentivize that kind of long-term investment. What you see are five pillars within the MCS across 27 strategic objectives. Uh, next slide. And, and you'll see here, yes, it's a lot. I'm not gonna go through all of these. Obviously, I, I do not have the time for that, but it's you know defending critical infrastructure, disrupting threat actors, state market forces to drive security and resilience, invest in the resilient future, and forge international partnerships. So these are really the five fundamental pillars that we're talking about. And within each of them, if you go ahead and read the NCS, which if you haven't, I strongly recommend, they are the basic goals of the administration to push forward to achieve a more resilient cyberspace. Now, a national cyber strategy is good, but if the strategy in itself does not mean much unless you have plans to implement it, unless you have plans, concrete objectives to go out and achieve. And so that is why ONCD released its implementation plan in July of 2023. Um, this is why I want to emphasize that this is a living document. You know, this is something where we created some goals and then what we have as we go through and we achieve those goals, initiate new goals that push forward the NCS. So you should see a new version of the implementation plan coming out this year with some of the with with new goals that highlight, you know, how we are pushing forward. As it says here, there were 69 initiatives in the original one, led by 18 different agencies, uh, departments and agencies, and many of these agencies also act as coordinating entities across other efforts. You know, there's obviously some that you see that, that were obvious, um, you know, CISA, ONCD, um, you know, DOD, others, all playing key roles across multiple initiatives across different pillars. Uh, next slide. And this is my very scientific um, way of looking at what, how supply chain fits into the implementation plan and into the national cyber strategy. By scientific, I mean, you know, putting red circles around the ones that are directly or tangentially related. Um, there's no, you know, this, you could make arguments for others, you could make arguments against, but this is to give the idea that supply chain exists across the entire strategy and really it exists across cybersecurity efforts writ large. And that's really what I'm trying to get here is, is that this is a, a broad issue that tackles multiple subjects and we realize that and recognize that. Um, within our national cyber strategy. And if you go to the next slide, what you're going to see here is I'm going to go very, very briefly. I'm not going to hit all of these because, again, time, but we really want to emphasize that, you know, this is not just an ONCD issue. This is something that the government is doing writ large. And it's just a brief chance to highlight some of the efforts being led across the interagency. So we have Pillar 3 here, you know, shaping market forces. We're talking about things like federal acquisition regulation requirements being driven by OMB. You have ONCD, which is exploring software liability framework options um, with, some mem with members of the legal community, you know, just an exploration of that. You have the software bill of materials effort, which is being led by, you know, was being led by CISA and is this ongoing effort. I know there are talks talking about SBOM. It's one of those you know, real key efforts. And as you see here, cybersecurity research funding as well, one of those things that government can be a real driver of. So through the Office of Science and Technology and Policy, as well as through others. You know, there's, there's countless other agencies that provide funding, but that, that is a good example there. Next slide. And pillar four, we're talking about investing in that resilient future. And of course we have, we have open source software security, uh, the adoption of memory safe languages. We have things like the Open Source Software Security Initiative, which is being led by ONCD, you have CISA's fantastic work in that area. I know they had an Open Source Security Summit, I believe, last month. Uh, you know, the various products and releases have been released by CISA. And then you have other efforts around secure by design principles, things that are done by 
DOE, CISA, ONCD. Secure by Design is something that's not just, you know, U.S. government or even U.S. business, but is, is international in nature. And finally, in the last one, uh, next slide. You know, well, this is where supply chain is kind of extremely directly mentioned. You know, it, it, and it talks about it from, you know, really the State Department leading efforts to promote secure and trustworthy ICT supply chains, you know, talking about things such as communications, as well as, as computer uh, hardware components and, and software to some extent. And then, of course, we have the work that's done by NIST, who the National Institute of Standards and Technology, who is, you know, one of our most crucial partners in a vast array of our efforts. Um, you know, this one's talking about a supply chain national cyber center of excellence. For those who haven't been to the NCCOE or talked with them, I, I highly recommend that as well. And I, I think it's one of those that is really key to our future efforts in, in supply chain. Now, having talked about this, we'll kind of get into those areas of effort related to ONC I've talked about, um, starting first with this document, Back to the Building Blocks, A Path Towards Secure and Measurable Software. This is something that uh, was released by ONCD in February, and it's really based on those two fundamental shifts in the national cyber strategy. You know, like I said before, rebalancing the responsibility to defend cyberspace and incentivizing that long-term investment in security and resilience. You know, going down to the end of the slide very quickly before running back up, I also want to go that this really aligns with work done by other departments and agencies to develop that ecosystem that is more secure and, you know, builds on many, much of the work done by other agencies. You know, CISA, NSA, FBI, NIST, others. You know, this really is something that is not, you know, stand on its own, but is one part of the larger cornerstone on this effort. So, when it comes to supply chains, most organizations focus on securing their own systems or networks and assets or trying to ensure a level of security from their direct vendors. So for us, though, we wanted to take a bit more of a high-level strategic approach from the White House, you know, identifying what actions upstream, far upstream, could be addressed that has the broadest benefit for the ecosystem. So this report kind of outlines two approaches. You know, they're not the only approaches, but these are the two we wanted to focus on in this document. Reducing classes of vulnerabilities, starting with memory-safe programming languages, and the development of better metrics as related to the cybersecurity quality of software. Uh, next slide. So, uh-oh. So, I have an install running on my computer, so I'm trying to make sure it doesn't restart, but just in case, I just want to let everyone know just in case uh, I, I drop out for some, for no reason. But moving forward on this, reducing classes of vulnerabilities, you know, part of the need to shift responsibility and make long-term investments into security is to identify ways and means of reducing vulnerabilities from occurring in the first place. You know, part of this is, you know, promoting a secure development process. We see that in the NIST Secure Software Development Framework that was, that was released in 2022. And the recently completed attestation forms that, you know, from, from CISA and from OMB, that, that will really go a long way towards helping with this problem. But the other part of that is finding ways to increase the security of what we call the building blocks of cyberspace. It's, you know, it's not a scientific term, but it's one of those things like, what are those foundational pieces uh, of, the cyber, of cyberspace that everyone uses, and really programming language is one of them. And then we get to memory safety. And I know this is not a new issue. You know, I know this is something that has been around for, for decades and, and something that we've talked about a lot across the government, but it is something that makes up a disproportionate number of vulnerabilities. You know, to harp on it, you know, before, others have found it can be up to 70, 70 to 75% involved of vulnerabilities involve some memory safety issue. And we believe that now is the time to kind of advocate for those changes to memory safe languages. And there's two real reasons for that. First is that, you know, the solutions exist right now. There are dozens of memory safe programming languages that can and frankly should be used. You know, technology manufacturers are able to design and build new products in memory safe programming from languages from day one. And it's something that we highly encourage. And with regards to transitions, when we have seen organizations transition to memory safe languages, we have seen a demonstrably positive effect on cybersecurity. Now, of course, it's not just the White House that has been calling for this, as I mentioned. You know, I put up here the document, the fantastic document from, from CISA, 
from NSA, from FBI, and from a bunch of our international partners, um, because it you know it highlights the, the criticality of this issue and what we see as you know a, a, an easy way to really draw down on, on vulnerability. You know, as the document itself says, unsafe code ba- transitioning unsafe code bases to memory safe languages are, is going to pay long term dividends in the form of safer products. So that will defray some of that upfront cost at some point. And by doing it from, from the starting point for new product, you are creating a more secure by design product. And I want to note for the last note on this slide, uh, we do recognize that switching to memory safe languages is, is not always feasible. You know, there are, there are exceptions and there are good reasons for exceptions. You know, the document itself talks about space systems and how, you know, for them, reliability and safety and consistency are first and foremost. And so the tra- any transition would have to be very slow to make sure that nothing is affected. And that's extremely reasonable. But we, use, we say that, and we also want to note, though, that it is among the most efficient ways to substantially improve software security. And for most participants, for most people in this community, this would be one of the easiest ways to really buy down on risk. Um, next slide. Now, we want to also talk about, about software metrics, software metrology. And I want to start by quoting a blog post from our colleagues at the UK National Cybersecurity Center, which talked about this and talked about the asymmetry in information available. And really, for all but the most sophisticated organizations, this, there's real there asymmetry in the software that they use and, and the products that they use. You know, they have very little you know, insight into the security of the products themselves. And this information asymmetry, you know, really negates informed buying and risk management decisions. And I think we really need to put all our chips on the table here, that we have to acknowledge the basic fact that there is a lack of empirical metrics to effectively measure what we're call, what we call here the cybersecurity quality of software. And we know, you know, before I get any further even, we know that this is a, a hard problem or an extremely challenging problem. You know, it's a problem that's been grappled with for decades. The, the document itself talks about the 2016 NIST workshop, which really outlined challenges around software metrology, software analysis, and even software behavior. You know, software is often, it can't be just, you know, described as a, a simple product, you know, like the chair I'm sitting on, but it's even, you know, more active and in some ways even, you know, has parts of it that, you know, can, that are dynamic. And so that's what makes it really difficult. You know, I also went through the agenda of this conference, which again, I'm, I'm kind of bummed I can't be there for, but there are several talks that I would love to go to that are either promoting or critiquing different methods of data collection and analysis as it relates to vulnerability management and coordination. Um, this is something that I have in, in my past doing different risk metrics where, you know, I would have people propose to me, well, if we hit a 70, on this, you know, then, then this document is good, then this product is, is good. Is, but if it's a 69, it fails and it goes away. And that is just, you know, what is that one point difference? How is one point really that big of a difference? And, you know, what can we actually glean from these metrics? And I think that leads to the XKCD met- cartoon here, which, you know, always good to find a way to put XKCD in a presentation. But is what happens if the metric just becomes a target? What happens if it's just a goal to, you know, a goal to clear that, you know, just to say you can? What if you try and play the system just to get to that number? And it really lessens the quality of it. And that's a worry when we come to metrics and when it comes to compliance as well. You know, this is a call to understand the problem, to, to push forward. And there's a reason we don't have saying we just want one number that every piece of software has to meet because we know that's not the goal. You know, the goal is to find those good empirical metrics. And we believe that despite all these hurdles, that we need to revisit this problem, that we need to push forward. We need to have, you know, researchers really dive into this. And even if they don't succeed, continue to inform the issue and not better understand the issue of empirical metrics or software. Because these kind of metrics are crucial for our future. They do provide stakeholders at all levels, you know, from, from the CIO down to the software engineer, you know, incentive, and it incentivizes investment in the development and purchasing of secure software, and it drives down risk over the long term in a way that few other ways could, you know, 
whenever we talk about risk across any other area of effort, any other industry, you know, metrics is the focus. You know, how do we, do, how do we drive those metrics? And we need to be able to reach that point within this industry as well in order to really drive down that risk. Next slide. All right, I talked enough about software. I'm gonna talk a little bit about hardware here. Um, we're gonna talk about semiconductor security. So obviously, semiconductors are a crucial issue for this administration and a crucial issue for, for the nation as a whole. You know, Congress in, you know, you know, in August 2022, passed the Chips and Science Act, which provided over $50 billion for semiconductor research, development, manufacturing, et cetera. 39 billion of that, it's for manufacturing incentives. You saw, you know, several billion released last week, for example. You also have 13.2 billion in R&D and workforce development. So you'll see, see things such as the National Semiconductor Technology Center. You've seen a release for a Manufacturing USA Institute around digital twins with semiconductors that, that will be going up. You know, these are crucial efforts for the government um, and maintaining U.S. leadership in this crucial technology that really is the backbone of everything else, you know, from automobiles to household appliances to defenses, everything. And security is a key part of that. You know, there's been this historical focus on secure software development, and we need to add secure hardware development to that as well. And, you know, for example, I want to put, you know, earlier this month, the National Strategy on Microelectronics Research was put out, which was done by the Office of Science and Technology Policy in the White House. And security of the supply chain is, is mentioned throughout the document. There's specifically one goal, goal 1.5, that talks about prioritizing hardware integrity and security. And the document says that it's essential that the integrity in cybersecurity be a foundational component of system design when it comes to microelectronics. So that is also worth pointing out that this is directly in line with the national cyber strategy which says that security, semiconductor development and manufacturing is a cooperative effort, right? We, we as government cannot simply do this alone. This is not something we can simply dictate. Um, this is something that requires intense, long-term strategic collaboration in order to reach that goal. So next slide. So, so what are we doing to, to address semiconductor security? So, NIST on February 27th held an all-day workshop for industry, academia, and government. Um, I was fortunate enough to be there with, with, with several different scholars and members from, from the industry and trade organizations to discuss existing and emerging cybersecurity threats and mitigation techniques for semiconductors throughout their life cycle. Now, now why am I mentioning that now? Is that because later this year, NIST will be publishing a post-workshop report on that with recommendations for securing the design and manufacturing of semiconductors. This will include next steps towards development of a standardized secure development framework. It's not saying exactly what the date will be or what will be in it, but it's laying out that long-term plan and goal. You know, as, as anyone who's worked with this before, there are very good reasons why things such as the cybersecurity framework or the software secure development, secure software development framework take a long time. It's because it's important make sure to get that industry feedback and to get it right. And this is kind of that goal is we're laying out the timeline to get that feedback and to get it right. The other thing we're doing, which I'm quite excited about, is that we are working with SEMI, which is the largest uh, trade organization for, you know, in, international trade organization for semiconductor researchers, manufacturers, et cetera. They will be developing what we call an industry profile based off the NIST Cybersecurity Framework 2.0 that was released in February. So an industry profile is basically taking the cybersecurity framework and tailoring it towards the industry itself. And this will be one, this will be one of the very first that's based off the new cybersecurity framework. And it is something that will be focused on the semiconductor manufacturing base, you know, the fabrication facilities and elsewhere. You know, obviously the larger, the very large organizations, the one that we can all name have robust programs, very robust programs, but this is an industry that involves thousands of organizations that is only going to grow in the number of organizations that are involved in it, you know, as the Chips and Science Act is rolled out. And this is one where we want to make sure that they all have the information available so that they can secure the systems and, and avert what would be an actual, you know, a hardware supply chain issue down the road. We all live through what the hardware supply chain concerns were in 2021. We all saw the effect of that. 
we want to make sure that that kind of effect does not occur within the U.S. and that all these facilities have the security that they need. And I also want to note at the end, of course, that this is, you know, directly in line with, with the goal of the administration and Congress and others to ensure that American leadership in semiconductor and innovation and development continues. We are, in, you know, we have been the leader in research and development for so long, and we have been a leader in manufacturing and are trying to recapture some of that with, with the Chips and Science Act. And with that, we also want to be the leader in the secure development uh, of semiconductor. We want to make sure that security is something that is built in, you know, secure by design as everything else should be. So this, you know, this really aligns with the administration's key goals on this effort. So next slide. And uh, I'm at 9.30, so this is, this is perfect. I, I landed right on time. Uh, so supply chain security, you know, concluding remarks, very broad. You know, we know that this is a long-term project. This is something that is not going to take two weeks, two months, until the end of the term, until the end of the next term. It is a years-long effort. And we think of it, you know, my background is, is in risk management. I want to buy down on risk. I want to lower risk. I don't think that you can ever really eliminate risk entirely. But by lowering risk over the long term, you create that better environment. The initiatives that were laid out today or that are in the National Cyber Strategy Implementation Plan, they're not endpoints. They're milestones towards lowering the supply chain risk for all Americans and really allowing that digital ecosystem to thrive. Now, none of this work, as I said before, can be accomplished by the federal government on its own or by any single stakeholder on its own. It does require unprecedented levels of collaboration. It requires, you know, us being able to reach out to you and you being able to reach out to us and tell us what's going on, what can help, what cannot help. And we do believe that, that by thinking in the long term and, and by working together, we really can get to that more secure, resilient, and trustworthy future. So with that, uh, I want to, next slide, um, thank everyone for, for their time and really appreciate it. And again, I'm really sorry I cannot be there in person to, to get grilled later on, um, but uh, I'm happy to take any, any questions. For those in the room, uh, if you can just raise your hand and we'll bring in Mike if you have a question for Andrew. First person. Andrew, we have one question in the room. Yeah, but see two. First. Uh, hi, Andrew. Good name. My name's Andrew as well. Um, I've got a question about NIST's funding. Uh, can you speak to why it's not directly proportional to the number of times it appeared on your slides? Um, well, Andrew, uh, good question. I like you already. Good name. Um, but the, the way I would put it is that, you know, cyber, the cybersecurity budget is, is something that is, is crucial to this administration, as you saw in the most recent administration proposal. Um, there was a proposed increase in the, cyber, in, in, the, in the budget for cybersecurity for the government. I think, you know, I'm not in a position to talk about the ins and outs uh, of, of the budgetary process and, you know, why this organization reads X amount versus why this other organization receives Y amount. That's really up to Congress and the administration and a variety of factors. Um, that being said, you know, what I would say is that my, myself personally and my office are one of the best, greatest advocates for the work NIST does. Um, my, my, my work, what I do, you know, I'm not someone who can, who can dive in from an extremely technical perspective, but my work would not be able to be done without the computer security team over at NIST, um, without the broader effort of, of NIST, without the CHIPS program office and the others. So, you know, I, while I can't really give you a good answer on why NIST funding is not at the level that is comparable to what you see, you know, in, within the effort. Know that, and, you know, we do take the budget seriously and we do keep in contact with, with NIST and others to try and understand where budgetary concerns are. Hi, Andrew. Uh, this is Dio. 
my question is about the semiconductor security. Uh, you mentioned that it requires um, a collaboration between government and uh, stakeholders and companies. Uh, my question to you is, does your office, the Office of Presidency, uh, already engage collaboration with semiconductor companies today? So, so yes. So we have been heavily engaged. So, you know, what this actually, you know, this, this idea, you know, was something that has been bubbling under the surface for a while. And it's something that we were approached by industry about to get, to get help get off the ground too. You know, I'm, you know obviously I'm not going to talk individual companies, but they were both large and small companies and trade organizations um, that really helped push this forward. And it's because that they want this, they want some basic framework. They want some common understanding, not just from, from the industry organizations within their, you know, within their trade group, but from the broader industry and community and frankly, from the federal government. They all, we all want to be working from the same page. So after those initial talks, we had further talks with the different trade organizations and with, the, with other um, companies as well. We talked with our federal interagency partners and as I kind of mentioned on the slide, the cybersecurity framework profile for manufacturing is going to be done by the industry's largest trade organization. You know, it's not ONCD writing it. No one wants ONCD writing their cybersecurity framework profile. This is something that is, you know, going to be done by the industry with support, in coordination with NIST and with our office, because they see the value and the need of it, you know, from the largest provider down to the smallest provider. They view this as a crucial next step. This is something they want to do with us and we want to do with them. So I think, you know, for us, it, it really is something where, you know, it is that it, it is going to be ongoing collaboration with not just, you know, the part the industry themselves, but obviously with security researchers and others to really understand the issue and to then build out these these products and these profiles and other and other areas of effort moving forward. Uh, this is Sarah Evans. Thank you so much for being here virtually. Um, so my question is about making security less abstract to the American um, consumer. So I love the strategy. I love the implementation. Um, is there any plans in the future to do some stress testing, you know, and where we can show you know, the re the resilience or maybe the opportunities to improve resilience in the supply chain? And I'm thinking about our very memeable moment with the toilet paper during the pandemic. And, you know, it all made sense, but we didn't really think about it too much before. Is there is there any plans to kind of make it real with some uh, stress testing in the future? So... Uh, what I would do is, and and this is one I'm going to, any answer I'm going to give you here is not going to be 100% satisfactory, so I apologize on hand. But what I would point to is from, from that hard supply chain, not talking about software, but actually talking about products. You, you know, you can look at what the administration has done with their supply chain. You know, they put together a supply chain and resilience council, which is, you know, really up at the secretary level of the, all the important members of the administration that work on supply chain related issues. You've seen different agencies put out their, you know, different supply chain data organizations, organizations for data and analysis. So DHS has, has a, a new supply chain organization. Department of Commerce has its own supply chain organization. I've been talking with Department of Transportation who has their own, has, has their supply chain analysis efforts. And part of the President's Council is bringing these together to really get that full grasp. On, on supply chain as an issue. And what you will see is a quadrilennial report, which will be coming out this year, which will outline you know, where, what supply chain priorities are and where the issue is. Um, I think from a software perspective and from, from that cybersecurity perspective, and that's a bit more difficult to do. I think, you know, from, at least from my perspective, you know, it's, it's security is, is, can often be seen as the absence uh, of, of it, effort or the absence of incidents, which is kind of harder to, you know, measure because, you know, what happened? Well, what if it was just a quiet time? But I think what you're seeing is from this administration is that, you know, we are trying to understand the whole supply chain from across the wide variety of areas and understand where those pressure points are 
and where prioritization needs to be had. And from there, work to drive that down. I think that's where you might see in the future what you're talking about in terms of, of, of stress tests and areas to really where we really see what can we see that's actually really worked versus where do we still need to improve. Hey, Andrew, we had a question on the Discord chat. Um, somebody asked, what is the basis for memory on unsafe language uh, being the majority of vulnerability issues in the last five years? So the basis is I would return, I would return you to the report, which cites the different, which cites a, which cites a couple of these different studies, um, as well as, as from the, from the CISA and NSA and FBI report. You know, I would say that, you know, that if they are the, you know, they help outline and provide the actual different research that, that justifies that number. You know, of course, we can have, you know, you can get in the weeds and you can make different argumentations, different arguments. Well, they are not, you know, if you look at the top 10, they are not 70% of the top 10, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, it's the goal is, is here is, you know, trying to reduce risk at that broadest level trying to hit as much as possible. Where's the most bang for the buck? And I think that's why we that's where we hit on this with memory safety. That's where I think you hit other agencies and other organizations hit on this as memory safety is crucial, is because it really does just remove for the for the most part, not entirely of course, but remove one large area of concern, you know, moving forward. And that's where you've seen it and you've seen it from, you know, we have partners that put out plenty of supporting statements with that is that you know this is something that is that is broad and that is that that can be done and so the thought is well well let's go do it Let, let's make this happen hi andrew my name is ryan thanks for speaking to us virtually today i appreciate it um my question is mostly about uh kind of a follow-up to the um unsafe memory language uh, transition that the ONCD is trying to lead. Um, and so I know that's kind of a demonstrably large task in and of itself. And so I guess I'm curious if you can kind of speak to some of the long-term strategies that the ONCD is kind of uh, revolving around this transition away from unsafe memory language usage. And because, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a large hurdle. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So speak on that. Yeah. I'm just going to snap my fingers and it's done. So, um next problem but actually so so seriously it is it is we like i said and like you mentioned right this is not an issue with that's uh, just going to be done in the next six months it's not going to be done in the next year or two years um you know we talk about alternative languages that are memory safe you know having been around and had to be around for several years and even to gain any trust from the software development community before they would even consider using those in placements of of some of the you know, in place of C or C++, for example. So I kind of want to note on, on two levels what, what ONCD is doing. Obviously, we are one small part of the broader interagency. But, you know, for us, what we're focusing on is, is two parts within the next year. So this year, really what we're going to be doing is kind of first is, is bringing together kind of a forum or multiple forums for, for researchers, for industry, for others to discuss the two issues in the report, memory safety and software measurability, either together or separate, and, you know, identify plans of action to, to increase the adoption. You know, I, I, if you had asked me and you kind of been like, what, what are we going to do next week to, to really stem this forward? Uh, the answer is, I, I don't know. I don't have the answer for you directly, right? But this is something where we understand the urge. This is why it's a call, it's, this is a call to action. And the next step, is working with everyone to figure out what those actions are. You know, what is, what is it that we can do? What is it that we shouldn't do? What is it that industry can do? What is it that the community can do? You know, that, and I think that's really where we're going to kind of move in the next year. The other thing we're going to do, and this is the long-term plan, is really it comes back to, you know, supply and demand. So how can we stimulate supply and how can we stimulate demand? You know, with government, you stimulate demand, you can talk about acquisition, but we really want to talk about Supply, you know, it's how can we stimulate the supply of some of, of memory safe language in some areas that that is not common. You know, we talk about, you know, for example, and government getting, you know, through the FIPS process, the information processing standard, I believe, is a difficult process. And sometimes 
it can be a real taxing issue for an organization. And sometimes memory safe options don't become available because of stuff like that. So how can we, you know, from the federal side, lower barriers to increase that supply? And then from there, ensure that, you know, those who have the appetite for it know it's there and it's available. We don't, we're not saying necessarily increase demand because we also think that CIOs and CTOs and others if that option is available and has, does not have the effect on their system, we'll, we'll go to it. And so we think that we just want, that's our big goal there. We want to kind of push that supply um, to, to make that available for those in the future. And, and really, once that's available, and once we have these calls to action that can help drive demand in other areas, that we really will see that, that progress towards that adoption. Hi, Andrew. We have another question in the room, and you have about 15 minutes remaining. I'm good. Thank you. Jess Smith from PNNL. Something I'm going to dive in a little bit further on the memory safe languages. I've heard a lot about that. However, the national cybersecurity strategy also has a strong focus on our OT systems, our, our national critical systems, water, power, all of those things. A lot of those systems, memory safe languages are not going to work. Any words on how we can start combining those two lines of effort? Yeah, well, yeah. So, well, some, some brief words, right? Because I'm not going to sit here and pretend to be Andrew Pasternak, supply chain, and OT expert. But um, I, what, I, what I will say here is that I fully recognize that. And when I was kind of talking about some of, the, some of the space systems before, you know, I was referring a lot to some of those, those physical systems. You know, if you have you know, a satellite in space, you know, you are not going to transition the language over. And if you have a water system, you are not going to transition the language over and, and risk the water supply for a, a, an entity. Or, you know, when we talked with the semiconduct, semiconductor manufacturers, they talked about how they, the, the area they had, the time that they have to patch, for example, in, in a year to fix these systems on an OT is measured in, in hours for the year. So, you know, we fully understand that the transition is not something that is simply, you know, go and do it. You know, there are always going to be exceptions. I think what we would say here is that it's about prioritization. It's about where can this have the greatest effect? You know, transition does not happen overnight. Is where can we have the biggest bang for the buck? You know, where is the greatest security buy down versus, you know, the risk associated with that transition? And so that's where we, and it says this in the document, you know, you know, focus on prioritization, you know, where you can on that. And then, you know, obviously this should be part of the larger effort when it comes to adoption, you know, sec securing the, those OT systems, securing water, securing power, et cetera, um, those systems on the ground. So but what I would say to you is that they are concurrent efforts. You know, there are there would be places where, where they do cross over. And ideally, if it's possible at some point when with new products, being able to switch to those um, memory safe languages in new products, especially for sure. Um, but we see these as complementary and not necessarily um, conflicting. Any further questions for Andrew? Okay, if there are no further questions, we will go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, we do have a question in the room. <laughs> Hi, uh, Dan Ojalvo, uh, five. Um, I'm curious, uh, this might, I don't know if this is exactly within the semiconductor purview, but uh, should we see any uh, initiatives towards firmware signing or anything along those lines? So uh, it's it, 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 it's a it's a good question. The short answer is there is work related to firmware, but I am not the one who is fully, you know, involved in that so i'd have to get back to you what i will say is from the hardware firmware software side something like the secure semi from a semiconductor side 
will will be tackling that part as well in any sort of development framework because it's not just obviously about you know the silicon itself but what's built on the silicon so i think that would be you know that i know that's not a that's not a great answer there um but that you know that is something that that we do realize the challenge um and want to mm-hmm. ensure the secure development of that as well and whether it be in a semiconductor or the various other pieces of, of, of hardware that are outside the scope of that. Um, but I'm just not in a position to provide, provide a more in-depth answer on that. My apologies. We got another question in the Discord. How do we know or how do we identify the progress of the supply chain security? What metrics does the government use to understand if there is progress in the industry being made? So... When we talk about this, and again, this comes back to, you know, to the, to the one to the metrics question, which I know is not the same as the metrics question I talked about earlier. You know, that metrics question was about individual product. This is about how we talk about the security of the supply chain itself. I think, you know, some of the metrics you'll see is, for example, things such as those entities that are attesting to using the secure software development framework that's being put forward. I know that's not a perfect answer, but we're seeing things such as entities upstream taking those efforts to kind of secure the development uh, of their software and making sure that their vendors are doing the same. And, you know, that having that list open is one of those things where people can go see who has, who has letters of attestation, who is attesting to their the, the secure development of their product. Um, I think from that, otherwise it comes back to being, you know, where, where, you know, going back to where are the most common CVEs, where are the most common vulnerabilities, where are the ones most common being, being exploited, um, and, and really working from there. I wouldn't say that there's a single good metric system here. You know, how do you measure it? How do you measure threat and vulnerability across an entire ecosystem? It is, it is much more difficult. I don't think anyone say they have, you know, risk measurements for for an entire industry on something like security. But I think by putting together, you know, these individual measurements by putting together, you know, which are difficult in themselves and under, you know, by by holding these the developers uh, of these products that we use every day to, to account that they are doing it secure by design and, and really putting in the effort that they have. I think those, you know, I think those are examples of where you'll see measurements affecting that broader risk. Uh, thank you so much, Andrew, for joining us today. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, have a great rest of the conference, everyone. And if you're ever in D.C. and want to uh, chat about this issue or tell me how I'm wrong, please come and find me and let me know. Um, thank you all.